Tim Abraham, welcome to the podcast. Great to see you. How, how are you? Yeah, really good. Thanks. Um, I'm kind of, well, a little bit of relaxation, I guess. Uh, in my new role in teaching, we get these kind of things. Well, it was always called reading week when I was at uni, yeah. but it's, it's a week of no lecturing or seminars <laughs> and the uh, I think the students get away for a bit. It's almost like half term, really. So, uh, but we don't get a week off. There's loads of planning to do. I've got lectures to write and so on. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. But it's uh, nice to get uh, get away from it a bit and uh, not have the pressure of, uh, sort of uh, teaching all week. So uh, it's a bit of a bit of a sort of a reset button time. Brilliant. Well, I, I love it. How much are you enjoying it? Because it's such a, it's five years as a, a university lecture now, isn't it? And I was looking at some notes on your LinkedIn page, actually, 27 overseas tours. Well, obviously, a lot of people know you as Sky Sports News cricket correspondent. We worked together for a number of years as a fantastic broadcaster. But the change in lifestyle, I'm guessing, is, is quite different now being at John Moores University. That's right. It's mate, when I first, I mean, in a way, Ed, I'm still kind of getting my head around it. Five years in, a, a colleague uh, of mine almost told me he's been in this a lot longer than me. And he said it almost took him five years to really think that you're getting somewhere near cracking it and I, mm. I think a bit like sports journalism and, and tv <laughs> you never really crack it you're learning every no. day and I am definitely but yeah definitely I mean if you think of almost just going around the world and following England I mean both uh, home and away I I mean when you were covering England um, when they're playing t um, teams at home, it's almost like being on tour, but just in the UK, you know. So <laughs> it was. It was. I had a fantastic time. I mean, I loved. Um, I loved the travel. Obviously, I mean, as you'll know, Ed, it, it's it, it's hard work. I mean, you're pretty much on the go every day. I suppose for an Ashes tour that can push towards three months, mm. you're filing stories every day. You're sending interviews every day. Uh, even on travel days, you're filing. And that almost summed up the appetite that Sky Sports News had, and, and, and rightfully so, because with the way that technology improved, we were able to, you know, file stories every day. So we we're always trying to keep up with what's going to be in the newspapers, what's going to be on the radio. And the way that that became technologically possible meant that you're pretty much on the go all the time. So it was hard work. I mean, people, the Barmy Army had a song for me. They said, he's got the best <laughs> job in the world to, to some sort of uh, some tune as I walked around the boundary. And they were right. But I always say, if I made it look that way, then almost that was mission the compass because as you know it is hard work sky sports do push you hard they got their pound of flesh but it was a great opportunity to travel and what i really loved and i i think in a way um uh, an advantage i had over many colleagues was it was great to specialize in a sport i mean mm. obviously you know good tv reporters and, and you know like yourself you uh, especially in presenting in presenting you have to be able to turn your hand at pretty much anything yeah. and be that all-rounder and and that's and and you definitely need those qualities but I was able to really immerse myself um in a sport get to know the players really well uh and and build up a rapport and I'd like to think a good relationship with the players and I think that helped me in the stories that I delivered I mean you know a lot of the times I was doing stories when England weren't doing very well um <laughs> but um so but you've got to still ask those questions and you've still got to come of those stories but um I'd like to think that I built up a good relationship with the players that they, they understood and, and the England team were very good at doing this they always faced up to when they weren't doing mm. well and would answer questions you know honestly and I think that trust that you build up um is really important so I think I had an advantage where because I was there day in day out I was able to sort of build up that that rapport really so um yeah long tours but I you know I love sort of immersing myself in cricket uh, which is a which is a passion which I think is really important as well yeah yeah um, you ended, so, yeah you, you made cricket a real niche what was it a passion growing up did were you sort of a big football person as well because obviously it seems like I put something on LinkedIn the other day just saying that football's in this country and, and you'll probably speak to this with the students you have is almost a lingua franca that you will get some employment if you if you understand football but then it's obviously as you've done nice to have a specialty as well yeah, definitely. I mean, I joined Sky. I mean, I, for six years, I joined as a football reporter. The the you know there was uh, the, uh, this is back in sort of uh, 1993, uh, so long ago. But they were they were still kind of building up almost their portfolio, if you like, and they were becoming more ambitious with their program plans. It's amazing to think actually what we see as Sky Sports now uh, almost started off as a program called Soccer News, mm. and it was about well with the ad break, it was about 12 minutes in duration, <laughs> and it was just basically the top. Sort of, you know football stories of the day and a, a lot around their sort of live coverage 
then that became a Sky took on more sports. That became Sky Sports Centre, which was like a more ambitious, uh, almost half hour sports yep. news magazine kind of program. And then and then as Sky took more and more on, that ultimately was the bedrock for Sky Sports News, you know, the first 24 hour rolling sports news service. So I was there seeing that development right through. So it was almost like having a new job every couple of years, really. <laughs> But I joined as a football reporter. And yes, obviously, love my football, love all my sport. And I believe, I mean, something I say, say to my students, you know, coming back to that, you know, being an all rounder, you still need those abilities. Most of them are football fans. They love their football, especially yeah. in this part of the world. Although, you know, we've got students from all over the country. But yeah, love my football. And, you know, as I say, as a reporter for the first six years, just concentrating on working around those programs. But yes, it was all football for me, but a passion for all sport. But um, you know, cricket was a passion. And when I, uh, during the summers, I almost got loaned out to the cricket department and um, I sort of did cricket stories there. And it was, it was nice because it wasn't the quick turnaround of, of um, football stories. I was able to almost spend a week on a shoot and do a nice kind of nice feature piece for a yeah. magazine program called Pavilion End. And I really enjoyed doing, you know, it was a nice, it was a different kind of departure for me. But at, when Sky got almost the, um, the contract to show overseas tours, um, they they sort of wanted somebody to be day in day out with England. They knew knew I liked my cricket, and I kind of pitched it myself in a way. I kind of <laughs> thought, oh, this will be good to do. So I kind of went after it as well. And they said, yeah, let's let's do it. Um, but football always that first love, and and spent my, my my first six years at Sky solely covering football stories. It's it's quite a, a daunting prospect covering cricket because I played a little bit of cricket at school, but was never an aficionado of it, and actually. You realise I've got an old boy called Chris Coley who I've had on the podcast around here and he's he's involved in cricket. We went to Cheltenham College, played at Lords when he was a kid and he's you know very much into it. And the people who are into it are going great depth. And he always says to me, oh, I can tell when you're updating the cricket, you don't know what you're talking about and all this <laughs> kind of stuff. And But I mean, that's the thing as a journalist, you have to do, I, I think sometimes sports you don't cover as well. You have to sort of flat back, but I, I think, and just, you know, to use a cricket term, but also just keep it simple, stupid, I think is the format and give people the information they need. Don't go into too much detail about the type of ball that's been bowled or whatever it might be. Um, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting challenge. And it's, it, it, it is in of itself a sport that's got a rich history and a passionate fan base, hasn't it? But one that's going through an interesting time at the moment, the T20 World Cup and things like that, it's, it's where the attention and focus in the game, because the appeal to me of cricket is an antidote to the rest of modern life, which is test cricket. Whereas the thing that's making the money is the crash bang wallop of the T20. Yeah, it's amazing to think, isn't it? I mean, you're right. I mean, cricket isn't everyone's cup of tea and, you know, they don't almost understand uh, test match cricket, especially, which I must say is my love. I mean, going back to Shane Warne, who I was lucky enough to get to know pretty well, mm. both as a, a player and obviously as a commentator. I mean, I was sort of right there throughout his career. I was working in radio when he sort of first came through. Then when I was doing cricket at Sky, I obviously covered him as a player and then uh, then as a commentator and I used to love the almost the game of chess that he was playing with batsmen <laughs> I you know I could I was I mean that but that's because I was passionate about it but cricket is one cup of tea but what I will say Ed, it is amazing and you will know this and you've probably been in this position it's amazing the amount of stories that have come from cricket whether yeah. it's been match fixing uh, I don't know I mean go back to Shane Warne when he was banned from a world cup because of you know he took a you know sort of a banned substance there's uh, the, you know, going back to the the attacks on the Sri Lanka team uh, in Lahore, you know, yeah. and, and the, all the security issues, and uh, and and uh, you know, there were so many very newsworthy sort of issues to cover, you know, um, you, you know the um, uh, you know sandpaper gates, you mm. know, all these yeah, stories course, yeah. that actually do capture the public imagination. So I mean, I could go on, you know, ball tampering, you know, with the Pakistan and everything, and and um, uh, you know. It, it, the, the no balling, you know, the, or, you, you know, the, the, you know, and Pakistan, a lot of obviously was related to Pakistan cricket, but they, these became really big, you know, they was, were lead stories in sports journalism, you know, in, in newspapers, you know, and on Sky and so on. So, so I was actually very much at the centre of covering really big stories. It wasn't just a little add on or by the mm. way in the cricket, cricket stories. Uh, it's amazing how how they really uh, you know came to the fore. So I think I think that became really important, and that did you know capture people's um, imagination. And the other thing is, you say there, you just sort of um, reeled off there. 
uh, all the different formats. It's amazing to think. I mean, I can't think of another sport whereby there are so many different formats at the very highest level. I mean, yeah. you know, we've got the 100 now. We've got T20. We've got one day international cricket. Uh, you know, we've got test cricket. Uh, there's the almost these 10 over blasts as well that, you know, <laughs> sort of uh, going on. So it's amazing. Uh, but the, the challenge is there. Um, and we've talked about almost the the football dominance, the challenges there, you know, for the ECB, for world cricket to um, almost to reinvent itself in a way uh, and to and to capture the imagination. That's what the 100 is about, getting youngsters into grounds and things. Although I personally think, I, I mean, I, I think T20 does that anyway. I can't, I don't actually see a lot of, you're getting that, those same crowds and everything. And yeah. T20 can still have that appeal, but it's, it is something that's different so i understand that but yeah cricket it's not everyone's cup of tea that um and you know they are print especially on sky they are you know they love their football and it's amazing the service that they get from the football coverage on sky mm. but um cricket is really important and it does it there are so many there have been and there are so many great stories around cricket and i think that for me covering cricket on a on a channel like sky sports news it kind of made what I did uh, uh, not say not say uh, more important but it, it became more significant if you like yeah and the other thing I was going to say maybe in the depths of winters when I'm popping up on a on a beach somewhere or in Australia with a sunburnt <laughs> face uh, amid winter when there's all football going on maybe my reports just sort of stuck out a bit as well yeah a bit, of, of, sort of take a, bit, a bit of warmth and a bit of yeah when, you, when you're yeah. Actually just having the picture in from a test match in Australia or whatever and it's you know getting dark at four o'clock here and drizzly and rainy and you've got this bright gorgeous sunshine of Melbourne or wherever they might be it's, it's fantastic actually to to have that counterpoint and also just the wonderful broadcasters associated with cricket down the years and the the analysis and you'd have worked with some fine pundits as well that I think really bring it bring it to life great communicators in general that's right and that I think that's where I mean you know we've got VAR now it's so controversial but if you look at the way that sort of terminology is being used in cricket I know you know actually in in a sport like rugby league as well it's kind of set the way you know uh, uh, you know to the way that uh, technology is being used and you know make it more entertaining and, and more uh, sort of um, uh, instructive uh, mm. for listeners but yeah I mean coming back to that almost being that all-rounder or the, almost having that that journalist background that I did have um, it, the, you know I was and this is kind of quite unique really way I mean I, there was me and then you, they got this commentary box of just everyone was a former England captain <laughs> and then there's me you know it's yeah. like you know sort of Gower, Botham, Hussein, Bob Willis, Paul Allen there. these guys have all played you know they've all been there and done it and I uh, obviously, and that's I think that was the that's the way that Sky pushed sports broadcasting on is that, um, you know, they were very quick to use that talent, you know, from people who have been there and done mm. it so that they could get that that perspective. But I did think, actually, at times I thought there was a bit of a danger of it being a bit too in in that they would talk very technically about the game and quite rightfully so. But mm. sometimes I thought. And this is where I kind of thought where I could fit in a bit better was that I could ask the questions that maybe I don't know, the cricket fan would want to know yeah. or the club cricketer, you know, who hasn't played for England, who hasn't been in that dressing room and would almost try and bring it down a bit, you know, you know, with more simple questions and actually asking questions because that's what, you know, good journalism is all about. It's, it's about people, but it's about asking questions. Sometimes I thought, you know, pundit, and I don't know whether this goes across other sports, but I can see it sometimes where they kind of make statements or just, mm. you know, uh, where. Well, yeah, not, it, I, yeah, I think that's an interesting thing that I think that in some ways there's an anxiety sometimes to make a statement to give yourself emphasis or to reel off a lot of facts, but actually the how, what's, when's, how important is that still to the, the journalism students you're teaching? Definitely. And it's almost, you know, that's almost the big graphic we put up, you know, the sort of um, the five W's, if you know, who, what, why, when and where and how as well. So if you can throw that in there. But I think that's really important. And that's why I sort of tell them. And, you know, early on when they joined, I said about asking questions uh, is really important and, and, and never lose sight of that. And I'm so that's what I tried to do. I was in a I was in that amazing position. And it's amazing to be surrounded by these legends of the game. For, literally for me, there were sort of like, you know, posters <laughs> on the walls, sort of yeah. thing, you know, and. And, um, but uh, so it, so so I always try to remember that. Ask the players, and it's you know can bring it down to you know what will what will the atmosphere be like in the dressing room? You know, or to ask NASA Hussein, what do you think the, the captain will be saying? You know, after that batting collapse and that mm. sort of thing. So uh, especially when you're asking the pundits that, and you know, Sky, you know, 
quite rightfully so, using the pundits to to the full, um, you know, asking them, you know, almost that what question, how, and I, I think that was um, that was really important, really. Yeah, because otherwise, you, you, with a statement, you can kind of ro- road rail a pundit into a certain line of thought, where they either have to completely disagree with you, or yeah. they um, or, or they kind of just yeah narrowly summarise what you've said again, which is a strange a strange conversation if you think about it. You're not really getting much insight for the, the viewer or listener. That's right. And yeah, and, and, and that's where it can get very in and very technical. And I think cricket can be quite complicated at the best of times. So it's quite nice to try and sort of uh, bring it down <laughs> to earth a, a little bit, really. So, uh, and so also, where, 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 do, where yeah. do you sta- sorry, Tim, but where do you stand on that? Because I get asked and I'm clearly not impartial on this is what about ex players who are presenting who are asking the questions of other ex players? And I've always said that I don't think there's anything wrong with it, particularly a lot of them have done the training on the journalistic side as well and have earned their stripes to an extent. But I said there is a, a danger which you're sort of referring to there, which is that actually it becomes a sort of closed shop where you don't know what the layman or laywoman is, is wanting to ask. Whereas, you know, I, I always wonder about Gary Lineker, fantastic presenter of Match of the Day. But him asking Alan Shearer how to score goals is a bit of a, a ridiculous <laughs> setup, isn't it? Yeah, I agree. It's it's a really delicate one, isn't it? And and I and you'd have seen this as well. You know, the, this is almost how the industry is changing. And uh, I mean, here's me trying to almost pass on my experience to journalism students who, or you know, who what you'd like to think want to do what I did for so long, but they're kind of entering a world where now the role of the pundit is so much is a lot bigger and that they are mm. it's not just about um uh, them sort of giving their opinion on a game they are actually put in that journalistic situation it's almost like they're nicking the jobs maybe that yeah. i had uh, coming through and you know you see alan shearer actually i mean i'm i'm sure i mean i'm i'm sure arms with a great backroom staff and a lot of producers and editors and so on but putting together a uh, say a documentary about dementia in sport mm. he is he is at the heart of that story and they're obviously they're using his profile but he's doing a journalistic piece of work there you know yes. and um so it's not all just about you know the you know about you know the analysis on match of the day so you are getting pundit i mean you, jermaine genus is presenting the one show Yes. Now. Yeah. You know, it's um, you know from a from a you know a sports background. So I I do I am a little bit sensitive about it actually. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bit old school, and I think that it's really important that um uh, that we as you know reporters um uh, and, and have that journalistic background. So we do ask those questions. So there is no awkwardness. I mean, mm. and this applies to sport. And I, I I still kind of do quite newsy stuff now, which I quite enjoy. Um, coming back to the real basics of you know journalism and asking questions. It's about you know rounding up it's about holding people to account and that that applies in you can relate that to sport we're not talking politics here but you know you are asking a player you're holding them to account if you know if they if there's been a bad performance about a manager Mm. you are in a way holding them to account getting them to explain their decisions and so on for the fans you know uh, you know from the fans perspective you're you're trying to think what would the fans be asking you know whether yeah whether a team are doing well or if they're doing badly i mean here in the city where in Liverpool, you know, Liverpool had a, you know, their worst start to the Premier League in 10 years. And, you know, mm. but, but, you know, a few questions that, that Jürgen Klopp has had to answer. And that is sports journalists ask, you know, put, you know, for, for want of a better phrase, um, holding them to account, so asking important questions. I think it can get a, a bit too in. And hopefully what, you know, um, you know, uh, journalists with that uh, news background are the ones who can still ask uh, those important questions but we're definitely seeing that trend of former players very quickly as well going mm. into into journalism roles and you do see it on sky you know um um you know ian ward i mean great presenter that he is and you know very had a you know had a great aptitude and became a very good broadcaster but a former former player there um michael atherton's done bits of presenting here and there mark nicholas you know, yeah, yeah. yeah uh david gower you know sort of mm. leading the sky coverage um uh, uh, and do it, you know he he had he had a real good manner of being, but these are former players, and these are roles I think that as as young sports reporters, I I kind of I wanted to be the the next Des Lynham, if you were in mm, a way, yeah, you know, me and, too, and, yeah. yeah, you know, and but again, a guy who's come through BBC Radio mm. uh, and you know cut his teeth at you know BBC Radio Brighton or, or Sussex down in you know Brighton and everything, and and had that journalistic background, and I, I still think that's um, and I'd like to think that that's um, still really important, but it becomes more challenging for people who want to get into the business i think mm. if very quickly former players are, are sort of fast-tracked into those journalistic roles yeah the, ch- the changing of the roles the lack of distinction as well because you've got pundits becoming 
presenter, reporter slash journalist, but also reporters seemingly sometimes without journalism training with or without becoming pundits in the sort of digital age. How do you assess that? And what do you speak to your students about giving opinion? Because obviously at Sky Sports News, our old boss, Andy Cairns, was like, I'm not interested in your opinion. I don't want to give your opinion. <laughs> Whereas now there's a sort of slight subtle change where people, not necessarily, I, I present most of the lates on Sky Sports News in a Sunday afternoon when it's all updates, it's all bam, 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 facts, what, you know, asking a pundit what's going on in the game, et cetera. Whereas there are times of the day when maybe people are, are sort of, giving opinions you've got people like influencers sometimes appear on certain conversational programs and things I, I don't know what you what's your take on that and what you advise students around giving opinions and and sort of being a, a, a pundit in a sense without the playing background uh, that's that's a really interesting book and I've not looked at it in 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 a way in a great deal of lot of detail the way you put it but you're absolutely right I mean this is what digital has done um whilst I mean you know in our industry you know there are you know I just read last week about you know BBC restructuring and you know there are cuts in local radio and so on yes but where, but, where I cut my teeth, like I, I did local. Absolutely, TV, yeah. I mean, I was, I, yeah. yeah, I was. I read, my, my first job was at Red Dragon Radio in Cardiff, and then mm. I moved on to become the sports editor of 2CR in Bournemouth when Harry Redknapp was the manager there. So what a great time for me as a Brilliant. young, yeah, you know, uh, and they had great cut runs and things. So, uh, and then it was great going back to when I was at Sky, uh, working at Sky, and then <laughs> dealing with Harry Redknapp because you know you build up those nice little relationships. Yeah. And so. So and then I moved up to LBC in London and I worked for IRN and then then Sky. So I think I mean, just coming back to our earlier point, there was that I think for us, there was that career progression, you know, it's like local radio, maybe not. And then you love, you know, if you wanted to get into TV and that's that's what Des Lyman did. You know, mm. that's what Jim Rosenthal did. And that's what John Motson did. You know, yeah. all these all these peoples. So that's the way that they cut their teeth again. You know, I was well, in inverted commas, proper journalists, you're properly trained. Um, but so but the industry is changing and because of digital whilst there are cuts now in local radio and uh, uh, um and 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 in local tv as well because of digital there are actually more different newsroom roles now um you know it's like looking after social media feeds that sort of mm. thing i mean art i'm no expert here but i i've sort of looked into the role of artificial intelligence in 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 journalism whereby it does a lot of the, almost the checking almost the more mundane stuff almost the ringing around that that's coming into sort of newsrooms now so and, and data journalism is is massive now yeah. even even on television that you know if you look at sky sports news now what I notice now is, you know, the use of the uh, the touch screen and that sort of thing. It's mm. bringing up stats. It's you, you know, it's like what what a what a player is saying on social media, that sort of thing. So from um, uh, uh, there are different roles, if you like, and different jobs. But is especially. it different type, different type of person appeals to that? Because obviously you were a, a hardcore sports fan and journalist who went around the world. Is this a lot of these jobs that seem to be a lot more desk bound, don't they, in in nature? They do, and that's right. And I, I, I was thought again, old school. I, I think I'm, I'm coming back to what I say to students: nothing beats face-to-face -face contact and actually speaking to people. And mm. I think, I think that really holds true. I think a lot of problem with the young generation now, and I get this, and I, I do hear this even happens it happens professionally in that uh, they're chasing a story here. We, I mean, we have our news days where they are out producing content and mm. so on, coming up with story ideas. And, um, and and something doesn't come off. And they said, oh, well, I sent the email, but I didn't hear anything back. <laughs> no, but, but don't like picking up phones. It's interesting. You have to... Exactly yeah, that. Yeah. And there is a... There is a not so much a phobia, but a bit of a oh, have I got to you know, have I got to speak to somebody? Or because I still I still had that um, I still had that thing about you know sort of speaking to people mm. get, and getting if you can. We used to call uh, it phone numbers. bashing, didn't we? If you're setting uh, up yes, a, ra it, a, a yeah. radio show, you had to sort of phone bash people to get guests on, and you sit there and you know just with a, right, a, an old yeah. fashioned contact list and, and rattle through them to try and book yeah. people. Yeah, coming back to Andy Cairns, and I, and I tell this to students as well, I so much relate. Isn't it amazing, Ed, how things you are told um, in your career uh, and the things that really stick, and I, I tell, and, and this is what I, you know, I try and pass on. I remember Andy uh, came out, uh, I think after one meeting, and he came out, and I think just around the, I wasn't in it, because, I, you know, because we were, 
you'd have your production meetings in the morning. You're probably part of them. And then it's, and so then you get the phone call and, uh, and uh, you know, you say, oh, you know, we want, uh, we're looking to test this or we want Alice to cook to talk about this. And I know damn well, this is what Andy Cairns has said in the meeting, you know, that, so, <laughs> yeah. but I remember once at a meeting, he just almost went around the say, so how good are your contacts book? Um, you know, what, you know, you know, how strong your contacts and people would look around. And he said, right, the next thing you go to, I want you to come away with someone's number i don't care who it is but when you're on a shoot or on a story shout, yeah come come away with the story and i'll um, well my former colleague your colleague um dharma seth uh, mm. i think he was at crystal palace uh, and then dharma obviously become so sort of forefront of transfer deadline day and and uh, but he um uh he came uh he came back and he went to andy oh i, I was at palace today and i've got I, I, there was a play there and oh, there's this bloke knocking around he was actually an agent and i was talking to him and i've actually got his number and, and actually down the line um, i i don't know who the play was but this agent was at the center of a big kind of you know yeah big transfer you deal. never know darmish had his number and was able to get some really good content because of it and i thought i always thought that was a really kind of good lesson so yeah yeah getting contacts is is really important again that's kind of that old school you know having a good contacts book and and ring up and speaking to people yeah but it does seem a young generation thing that we have to um mm. we have it's to almost seen, seen as being too too rude or invasive to ring someone yeah yeah. yeah yeah and the other thing that i and this is a bit of a wake-up call to me in a way because i kind of took it for granted and uh, you'd have done this as well but it's, it's going out and getting vox pops as well yeah uh, you know speaking to the public and you know ask you know see it lots or getting fans reaction or just getting reaction to story it's an immediate angle isn't it or just yeah to, you know just to update a story i mean you know we, we do them for everything but i just sort of we had this a liverpool story i said right okay let's go down there'll be people around the club shop let's get their reaction to this story and i just almost sent them out to do it and it's just that and there's one guy and um and this is the thing you know sometimes students have a few you know sort of confidence and men to be honest as well me mental health issues and things like that and mm. and he just came up to me uh, and he just said oh I don't I don't think I'd be very good at that or I, I'm a bit worried and I and I just said and he, he did actually suffer from Asperger's does it and I just yeah. thought I felt really bad that I just assumed that people could just go out and do that and we well, all feel you always feel a little yeah. bit awkward doing it when you haven't done it when you first you get into it but then I remember going down to sort of speak to people when best mate passed away the local radio station sent me down to Worcester race course you know to talk about and the horse go fans were just talking and I often found that with a little bit of news that sport was easier to get vox pops than say politics or anything like that it was always yeah. a, more, a yeah. more positive but just bro brokering that contact with a stranger whether it's in person or on the phone I think builds a muscle that's that's important for life not just your job Definitely. And it is, a, I mean, you'd have been in as well where people don't want to talk to you and they do blank mm. you. They do say, oh, I haven't got it. You know, it's, uh, yeah, you know, just, I mean, often I'd speak to the Barmy Army, but yeah, you had to choose that because especially if they've been on the beers all day, you know, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but it was, I, you know, I regularly did that and, and they'd be kind of, but, but some people just say, oh, I'm not talking to you, I'm not talking to the sky, whatever. So I, I remember once I was in Bridgetown in Barbados and I was doing Vox Pops and this bloke said, because <laughs> Adam Leventhal, uh, before, yeah. he was doing the one day stuff. And the bloke just said to me, oh, where's that Adam Leventhal? He's much better than you are. <laughs> and I really? went, oh yeah, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, you know, oh, it's okay. like, you know, but. But you do, it, I wouldn't say it's the worst part of the job, but it was almost because you want to talk to player, you know, I was, oh, I don't want to talk to the, I want to talk to, you know, the players and all that sort of thing. And, uh, yeah. you know, um, so, but it's part of the job and it's, you know, and it's, um, and so often it, it makes, it makes for sort of good telly as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's just the blurred lines you get sometimes between um, pundits, fans and journalists now. It's almost like mm. all, all three roles are sometimes occupied by the same person, which is quite a, a strange scenario, but from Barbados, to Liverpool it's great that you're happy it's such a change in lifestyle I'm glad it's, it's worked out and giving back I think it's a really nice thing when you get to a certain stage and age you've got that experience what advice do you give to people generally now students because it is such a changing landscape isn't it? there's constant flux with the digital age people talk about the attention economy and all these things where people are wondering whether quality sort of long format journalism in particular is 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 there do you say is it the fundamentals you come back to that that will always be relevant whatever you're doing at communication and the, the right questions and so on and so forth definitely and we touched on it i just you know holding true to those just you know asking questions and um you know just um uh, there are two things a lot of people are doing the, uh, sports journalism especially in this amazing sporting football city um they are football fans and uh you know and i i just say look once you 
once you become a reporter, you're like, of course you're football fans, of course you're sports fans, but you're not fans with a laptop. You know, you've got to, you've got to take that step away. There'll be occasions mm. where, you know, we're all covering teams or we support teams and, and you might be covering a game and they lose or whatever. So it's important to take that step back and, and, and uh, detach yourself from being a football fan. And I see it a lot in the writing and the coverage that almost that fan speak tends to come in so you've just got to mm. you've got to take should, should we be out as fans as well that's an interesting one i know that people increasingly broadcasters seem to be saying who they support it's always jeff stelling could but he was hartley paul so it was never particularly incendiary to people but i often wonder that whether it undermines yeah. us yeah i know um, uh, uh, alan green on radio five live i think i mean there was i mean i never think but there was almost this uh uh feeling that he was a Liverpool fan yes, so every yes. time he was covering Man United or but I don't think he ever sort of really came out and said it you know it became almost a bit of a story the fact he was you know in, in his commentary and everything like that I don't think there's any harm in that you know we no. all have uh, uh, I think you know we all have you know supply you know so, so long as you're sort of staying uh, you know balanced and impartial in your reporting and of course you know football fans they will <laughs> criticize their team they will say well, we were rubbish today yeah. or whatever so yeah, exactly. just because of that you know or you know or you, you, need to be this... yeah, you need to be balanced in both directions yeah yeah absolutely, absolutely. yeah, yeah you, you could, so it, it doesn't mean to say that you're all the time sort of talking up your team at all right it, you, you know you, it, and you can almost be overcritical as well i guess in a way but um uh but that's what football fact you know the thing about it is it's such a well all of sport is so much about opinions and everything. And that's what, you know, that's what drives it. That's what drives Sky Sports News so much as well. Different fans' opinion, what's being said on social media, what pundits are saying uh, and so on. But I think journalistically, uh, though, um, you know, holding true uh, to those principles, asking questions uh, and, and not being afraid to ask those difficult questions as well. But you've got to do it. And I'm sure, you know, and this is your skill. You, you do that in the right way so that you get the good answers um, out of uh, out of people. And I think people will respect you for that. They know you've got a job to do. And I think um, mm. you've, got to, you've got to be seen to be doing that job and not, not be afraid to do it. And that comes uh, with confidence. But um, it, It's so striking a balance between not, I think some people are, are overly adversarial where actually you don't get anything out of an interview, whereas other people you can veer into not asking the tough questions, but it's somehow having a nice way about you to, to phrase things and to open up a conversation where... The, the other person's responsive but you can get a substantial answer isn't it that seems to be the, that and it's, it's an art as much as a science and one you yeah, have to that's, practice that's right asking yeah and you know when you get lines from uh i mean you know the the producer yeah whoever it was it, it's almost like if i would do a press conference an england press conference and i ring in so you're like yeah um you know they've done the press conference they'd say the question you get asked is, what did they say? Because they want to know what they're going to, how, what's, what's the top line of this story? So you have to be able to sum up, you know, what, what's been the thrust of a press conference. But well, um, um, press conferences are different, obviously, because it's all in and so on, or you're yeah. with other broadcasters or the other press. But if you're doing an interview, a nice, uh, you know, and you've got almost, uh, you know, um, exclusive access, so you've got a nice one-to-one -one interview, the lines that you get that in, uh, that from that interview are going to come from your questions, you know. So you've obviously got to, you've got to ask the right questions so that you, as you say, Ed, you don't just all just get the bland, yeah. we're looking forward to the game, or I thought we... And listen, thought, yeah, and pick yeah. up on the threads from... It's like having an idea of what you're going to say, but pick up on the threads from them because you don't want to... Yeah ignore something that could be a great thing to tug at and could lead to a great answer you've said something there that i do say to the students as well you've obviously got to do your research and be prepared you've got to know the right lines and the right and you're going to have the questions you're going to have the lines that you're interested in but as you said and and this must be you know in what in what you do as well listen to those answers because something could be said i mean it's and that you could mm. pick up on and actually is actually could be more interesting or they yeah. reveal something that you need to sort of press them on or ask them about so it's not just about and i say to the students yeah you probably got your questions but oh okay yeah th and also uh, what do you think about you know uh, mm. don't get too regimented really listen to um to what those answers are because that and then that gives you the chance to press them or get them to expand on things pat murphy who was a great um who, who, who you you know radio i don't report. know if you know five yeah, live, yeah. The middle, yeah five live who's just a really experienced um 
uh, you know, sort of journalist, um, a really good broadcaster, but he did a lot of cricket tours. And we do, you, you know what it's like, Ed, you do, we get access to a player sort of most days or every day. Uh, I might go first doing a, a, an interview for Sky, then he might go or he might go. So you get the same player, basically, and, and the papers get that mm. player as well. But he would do the interview. And, and um, I, I remember, it, I think he was interviewing Michael Vaughan. And Michael Vaughan said something. And Pat just went, Really? <laughs> and it was just one word, yeah. but another question and pressing him on what he just said, you know, so and I just and I, I was alongside and I, and I took something, I thought, but I say, what a great little technique that yeah, was. Yeah, art of conversation, to, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and art of conversation is really important, you know, so, but just by that one question, that's one word that takes so long, it's, and then I think my point, well, yeah, because we, you know, and he, he had to expand on what he just said. So I thought that was really clever and, an, and a good way of summing up where you're in that situation of just asking a very simple question and, and, and getting a, an answer. And you meant, you said there, everyday, um, everyday conversation, everyday language is really important. And I say to you, don't suddenly think because if you're writing for a piece for a website or mm. you're you know uh, asking questions for broadcasting um you, you know it's that balance and obviously you do this as as well you, you know this is what you do but you 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 keep it in everyday language you're not yeah. suddenly going into almost uh you know sort of uh, press co press uh release speak or pr speak you are yeah. actually because you are communicating I so especially when you're writing a piece or doing a piece of tv or radio journals or writing for a website uh don't suddenly use words that you wouldn't do imagine that you're as we're we're talking now um or if yeah. we are having a coffee or we're, we're we're in the pub having a drink how if you saw something how would you tell your mate what you just seen you know whether absolutely it's a, little, uh, a road traffic accident you know, God, you never you never guess what i just saw or yeah and if you're talking about a game don't suddenly go into you know just obviously not go into slang but mm. just, just imagine that you're telling a keep friend it simple, about, yeah. Yeah, yeah keep it simple and and that's where you can use language and and so on um so that's that's what i say as well keep it simple everyday language but remember you're trying to you know you're painting a picture for somebody or you know so you're providing information basically yeah brilliant i think that's where radio experience comes in but that that art of conversation is part of the reason i started the podcast and actually listening to people has really improved that and, and then you try and you can practice like you say in everyday life talking to people tim we could talk for a long time but i think time has, has beaten us so i've got to i've got to move on to um to the, the next part of the day but it's been wonderful to catch up i'm glad you're well and i definitely would recommend a wannabe journalist coming to john moore's to, to study under you because i know you'd be you're full of enthusiasm full of knowledge full of experience so it's, it's been brilliant to to spend some time with you and you share that insight thank you no thanks Ed. great and you got me just going it, it makes you realize you know what obviously what a great almost job you had but yeah you, what i do now i really enjoy passing that on and um I uh, I could always talk, I could talk all the time. I think we all can about you know because we're you know about journalism and that because it's that kind of thing. But yeah, yeah I, I just another thing is passion, enthusiasm is so good. I I what I mean I think I was okay at what I did. I wasn't brilliant. I wasn't outstanding. There were a lot better TV reporters than me. But I think people when I sort of left, they said, "Oh, we always I just always liked the way you know you're passionate, and enthusiastic, yeah. and that came over." And I if that was the case, and I think that's that's a good thing. I'm I'm very happy about that. But yeah, I'm very passionate about it, and I I think that's really important. Really shine. So I think it's in everything, and I think it's great for the students that, that you've got now. And you were you were a great reporter. You're very very modest, Tim. Thank you. <laughs> Speak to you soon. Great, great to speak to you. Cheers.